Welcome to my Dung Podcast. Today's special guest is Caitlin Curtis, where she talks about her newest book, Living Resistance, Embracing Cyclical Thinking, Resistance, Art, Deconstructing Faith, Mother Earth, and so much more. Please stay tuned. Join Trip Fuller and Dan Koch for a new homebrewed Christianity class on Live Before You Die, Existentialism in Psychology and Theology, starting October 3rd, 2023. This is a transformative course which delves deep into the nexus of existential thought as viewed through the dual lenses of psychology and theology. Participants will embark on an introspective journey to confront and understand the fundamental truths of human existence. This class is pay what you can, including free. Sign up at www.tripfuller.com. One of our wonderful sponsors of today's podcast is Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, a progressive, spiritually centered servant seminary that seeks to form courageous leaders in the way of Jesus to cultivate communities of justice, compassion, and hope. Garrett offers degree programs in different areas of church and nonprofit leadership, including a Master of Divinity, Master's Degree in Counseling, Education, Public Ministry, and Theology, Doctor of Ministry, and a Doctor of Philosophy. If you want to take the next step in your education, you can study in person or online at Garrett. Apply before November 15, and you could be eligible for a minimum 65% scholarship up to 100% off tuition. Visit G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash M-A-D-A-N-G. That's G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash Madang. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com. This is Madang, an outdoor living room for guests to share their experiences and their work. I invite you to come in and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang Podcast. Today's special guest is Caitlin Curtis a poet, author, and spe- and public speaker. She is an enrolled citizen of the Potawatomi Nation and has grown up in the Christian faith. Caitlin writes on the intersection of Indigenous spirituality, faith in everyday life, and decolonization within the church. Her latest book, Living Resistance, an Indigenous vision for seeking wholeness every day. In Living Resistance, Curtis teaches that resistance is for every human, who longs to see their neighbor's holistic flourishing. Caitlin has contributed to On Being, Religious News Service, USA Today, Sojourners, among others, and was interviewed for the New Yorker on colonization within Christian missions. In 2018, she was featured in a documentary with CBS called Race, Religion, and Resistance, speaking on the dangers of colonized Christianity, and was also named as one of Sojourners Magazine's 10 Christian Women to Watch in 2018. Uh, Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis wrote about the book, Curtis fiercely yet gently calls us home to care about our souls and our bodies, about each other and Mother Earth. It is a timely and timeless call to live resistance every day as we build the world together. So, Caitlin, thank you so much for coming back on Madang Podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you are my first returning guest, so it's so exciting. I feel like I know you now. (laughs) That's wonderful. That makes me so happy. Yeah, so thank you for coming on for your other book, Native, and then now this beautiful book, Living Resistance. I, I just love it so much. Yes, it's such a beautiful, your other native is beautiful. And then this is beautiful. It's like, wow, I don't know how you get all these beautiful covers. And also, I love your book titles too. So thank you so much for coming back. Yeah, thank you. So before we get into the book, you also published a children's book, Winter's Gifts. 
So can you, if you have a copy, if you can show it, because, uh, you know, this goes out in audio and video. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about how you wrote that. And yeah, Absolutely. it is so beautiful. This is my first children's book, and it's actually going to be, it's book one of a four-part series on the four seasons. Oh. Um, that are going to come out over the next few years. So this is book one. This is winter. And uh, next year, I believe, will be summer and then spring and then autumn. So I wanted to write a children's book for so long. You know, I, um, and that, that uh, word you read from Jackie, you know, she writes about how I am fierce and gentle. And I write in my book about how that I, that's who I feel I am at the core of myself, fierce and gentle, which is to a lot of people, a conundrum, but it's, it is who I am. And, um, and so the both sides of that, but especially the gentle childlike curious side of me has wanted to write a children's book for so long and to lean into, um, those deep questions. Children's books are so powerful for adults and kids because we get to ask these deep questions. And so this book is about a little girl, a little Potawatomi girl named Donnie and Donnie oh. is exploring her relationship to mother earth in this book and thinking about you know what gifts does winter give us besides just the holidays or the things we normally think about winter can be difficult for us sometimes so what if oh, we yeah. reimagine it as it's a gift of rest and it's a gift of waiting and presence and and care and curiosity and so I wanted to sort of embody that in this book and I'm so excited to see people reading it to their children and the kids in their community that means so much to me Oh, that's so nice. I've always wanted to write one too. So, but it has never happened. So you are an inspiration to Thank so many you. of us. Yeah, that you can reach out to children and young people and adults. That's wonderful. And I think the winter's gift, I didn't realize it was going to be a series, but that's quite genius. So congratulations. Thank you. I, no, I, yeah. I decorate my house throughout the year. I change things each season. I've always been that way. And so it's just so natural for me. You know, all my books touch on the seasons and I'm indigenous. So we, we live on the seasons. We live this cyclical way of life and it's just so natural. So I'm, yeah, I'm just so excited. Oh, congratulations. And I think the theme that you mentioned about earth and the cyclical, you can, you can see it here in this book too. So, you know, I just love, you know, I loved native and for, I remember you said it, it's a lens for us to kind of see the world. You don't have to be Native American or things like that. And I just felt like this book, it became another lens for me to see our world, our context and what is happening. So it was so beautiful. So before we begin um, digging into the book, what kind of motivated you to write this one? Yeah. You know, releasing Native was really difficult because that book was like my memoir. You know, it was so much of my journey in being a Potawatomi woman and navigating, you know, with honesty and care, my relationship to, you know, American Christianity and the spaces I grew up in and my faith. And I, when I released that book, of course, it came out right as COVID hit. There was so much around it that was so difficult, but it was a painful book to write, um, really painful truths and honesty that I, I did need to write it, but it was, it brought a lot of grief out and a lot of burnout, honestly, and, and difficult conversations for me, a lot of triggering things for me. And I needed a book that was kind of my, like, what's next, you know, like I wrote this really difficult book that still was a hopeful book. Native was still about hope, but it was a lot of hard stuff. And I needed the next one to be a little more, universal, a little more like wider lens, more, uh, more interfaith dialogue, more, more um, expansive and kind of the, you know, when you have the hard stuff, we go through that grief or we go through that. How do we then, how do we hold it all? How do we embody it with care? And I just thought the best way I know how to do that is to think about this idea of resistance, but not just like the resistance we think of like the raised fist only, but what if it's actually about like caring for our own bodies and souls, caring for each other, caring for mother earth, you know, and I wanted to express it in a, hopefully in a way that people haven't considered. And, um, and I had so much fun writing this book and I read so many books to write this book, which was so much fun. I mean, I love, I love reading. 
I love kind of diving into the wells of wisdom from others. You know, it's such a gift of being a writer. We get to read each other's words and they inspire us, you know? And so this book was kind of my, my what now, and how do we, how do we keep going when the world is hard, when we, when we're broken, when we're tired, exhausted, when mother earth is exhausted, how do we keep going? Oh, wow. That's so beautiful because the book native, I actually used it in my own writing too. I quote you in a forthcoming book when God became white. So it was very, very, um, I didn't realize that it was a hard book for you to write, but now, you know, hearing you, I understand it was. So I'm really grateful for that book. And then this living resistance, I, now I'm actually this other stage of, yeah, how do we resist, you know, occupation or colonialism or any kind of evil? So this, you know, and the title living resistance was so meaningful to me. And, um, you know, at the beginning, you're talking about, we have to stop thinking um, in linear ways. So what is the other option from not processing things linearly? Yeah, we really, we really do that. And especially in the Western world, you know, we think of things on the the long timeline and we think of things, um, you know, we're, we're watching the TV show, the flash with our kids and the, there's so much time travel in it. And multiple worlds. And it is so mind boggling to think of things differently than we've been taught to think of things, you know, like I just keep, well, like pause the show and be like, what? I Like, can we explain, you know, my, my kids are like explaining it to me. I'm like, I don't understand. Can you guys please, you know, and um, it's so funny. And I think that that's how we are a lot of the time with our, our Western ways of thinking. We've been taught that we grieve on a linear timeline. That's not true that we you know, that we, we evolve as people, we change. Um, that's not really a linear thing. It's, it's, we change in cycles and seasons and, you know, and it's not just indigenous realities. I mean, cultures all over the world recognize the seasons and cycles. And, um, and so I wanted to create some sort of framework that would allow me to, to help the reader with this. And so this book is about these seasons and cycles you know, we find ourselves in and, um, and I created this, this framework called the realms of resistance. And we can talk more about that. Um, but I wanted to make sure it was a cyclical framework to help kind of break us out of that. We change in a linear way. And we, you know, no, we, everything is such like a labyrinth, like we're always going back and forth. And where does one end and the other begin, you know, like the seasons of our own lives, especially those of us who are wrestling with our faith or our spiritual life, it is not linear. It is so twisty and turny and there's so many curves and four, four steps backward again, and then two steps forward and then eight steps back. And, and it's, you know, you're wrapping and winding around yourself and other people. And, um, and I think that literally mother earth gives us a picture of how we can break up our year into these seasons. So why can't we break up our own life and our own ways of being into these, these seasons as well? It's hard. It's really hard to like disconnect that. Even for me, it's hard. And I, it's something I'm still learning, you know, but I want to, I love in my books, I did it in native too, you know, giving people something that they can hold that kind of helps them break away from the linear. That's so helpful. I grew up, um, you know, I was born in Korea. So I remember um, Koreans telling me that this linear is all wrong. <laughs> and that way yeah. Koreans actually think of it like a big spiral. It's a cycle yeah. you go back and forth, back and forth. Right. So when I read your book, I thought, yes, you are right. <laughs> I love that. What, yeah, that's what I was taught uh, when I was young, that everything is cyclical. So right. I really, yeah, I appreciated that section in your book of um, you telling us um, to move away from the linear understanding, but in the Western world, that's what we're taught in mm -hmm. schools from such a young age. So it's really hard to break away from it. So I thought your book was so helpful in reinforcing that, Hey, we Koreans weren't all that wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Even the, you know, the way we're taught to, you know, you're a child and then you leave behind childhood and now we're becoming adults. And, you know, it's so funny. We'll become adults. And then we have to realize that we're not quite done with our relationship to our child selves. So then many of us are returning back 
to find healing or to deal with our trauma. You know, we're returning back to our child selves again, trying to connect with them. We're not, we haven't just moved on beyond our childhood wounds or beyond what we needed then. We may still need it now as adults. And I find that that's also in the US something we do. Like we're moving on. We're, we're no longer kids. We don't play anymore. We don't, you know, we're now adults. Like we are good, you know, members of society. And I think even that can be subversive in a form of resistance is caring for our child selves again. Yeah, that's so beautiful. So thank you. So you just mentioned resistance. So your book, Living Resistance, can you define for us, you know, what, what is resistance and what do you use and how do you use it? Because it's such a popular term. Everybody right. seems to be just throwing it all over the place. So yeah, tell us what you mean by it and how we should be using this term. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I knew I would probably step into this um, wild conversation because when things become popular, when they become, you know, like the word decolonization is so popular. And, um, and I, I talk about it a lot in my writing, but um, I, I want to, I'm interested in taking those popular terms and like pausing a second and asking if we, if they mean what we think they mean and can they mean different things to different people or are they a static definition, you know? And so resistance is this, you know, scientifically it's that we're pushing against something or even in, in the world as humans, we're pushing against something we're, we're fighting back, you know, we're resisting. And I wanted to take this idea of resistance and kind of like, look at it, look at its different angles and facets and like, it's a stone or a rock and, um, stretch it a little too, and ask if it can mean different things. And so what I came to for this book is that our resistance in our daily life on the, the macro, the big, the big scale, our institutions, and also in the micro, the very minutia of our day is also resistance. Um, how are we using our life to exert energy against the status quo of our time? And every time period, every point in history has had its own status quo, a, a toxic, dangerous status quo, right? And where we have that today, and, and a lot of the, the toxic quo has probably been the same. The toxic status quo has been the same throughout the years, you know, white supremacy and colonization and hatred. And so how do we sort of exert energy against that, but not just pushing, pushing, pushing all the time, also choosing the good and the beautiful and the gentle on the other side of that, or choosing each other or choosing our relationship with mother earth. So it's not just the like, because if we are only pushing, we're just going to get exhausted and, and burn out. And that's not the point. We want it to last. We want this work to be lifelong. So we have to push, but also be choosing what's beautiful, be choosing each other, choosing kinship and solidarity. And yeah, but I, I wanted this, this term to feel like we can look at it in different ways and ask it questions and see what it teaches us. Wow, that's so beautiful. So thank you so much, because you do say it's a little different from the African American understanding or even theologians. So thank you so much for sharing about um, what resistance means to you. And um, you mentioned for Native, um, you know, you, it was a memoir, and you share about your Christian upbringing and, and kind of deconstructing. Here in this book, too, you're also talking about deconstructing faith. So tell us what that means to you and whether we should be all doing this. It's a good question. I think the, I mean, I think the power of the time that we're living in and um, these conversations is that we are people who are evolving. I mean, um, no religion is static throughout the centuries. It, you know, our religions are made up of people and we as people have to change. We have to shift and ask questions of the time we're living in. So. I find it very natural that we would say, well, how are, how should we deconstruct this? How should we ask questions of this? But I also know that it really scares people and, you know, the status quo, whatever it is, whether it's inside Christianity, whether it's not status quos often hold a lot of comfort for us. They're, they're the place where we don't have to ask a lot of questions. We can just be, things are just good as they are. We don't have to be scared, you know? And I think deconstruction can be really terrifying for people because it seems like it's just this downward spiral into nothingness, right? Or 
a spiral into into something really dangerous where God is not. And I don't I don't think that that's true. I think a lot of people are hurt and exhausted by the Christianity that we have created, adopted, the colonization that's embedded in it. And so we have to ask hard questions if we want to love each other better, if we want to love Mother Earth better, if we want to love ourselves better, we have to ask those questions. And you don't have to call it deconstruction. I know, I mean, people want a different word. You can pick a different term because we do that all the time. But um, but I find that deconstruction is helpful. And um, and I find decolonization to be helpful because it's even a deeper focus on the effects of colonization in our world and in, in our lives today. Um, but I think that uh, this work is also so grounded in our own stories and the power of storytelling and story sharing with each other. And I don't want us to be too afraid of that. And that may mean that people leave institutional church spaces. And I understand that that scares people too. Um, but our journeys are complex and I want us to hold that complexity with one another. And I, I hope that I held space for that in this book, especially for people to kind of process what that means for them. So as you began this discussion, you just uh, mentioned that religions change. Um, they're not static, et cetera. And I thought, yes, that's true. But you see many people, especially Christians, because that's who I'm most familiar with, we yeah. think that it Christianity um, is what it was 2000 years ago. So what do you want to say to those people? Because they think that whatever I'm doing as a liberation theologian or feminist theologian or all these post-colonial theologians, that that's wrong because yeah. we're not doing what people did 2000 years ago. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Um, I mean, I, I think it's important to hold the context of the origin of something very important, actually, um, to hold that the context of where something began, the resistance that was formed in that time period. And then we also have to ask, what does resistance mean for us today in this in this context, let's say. So within the Christian context, it has I mean, it has to shift and change. Um, some things may not change a lot. Some things may stay. I mean, but um, but there's a lot in my context of my life and my story, there is a lot of hurt that has been done, a lot of oppression that has been done in the name of Jesus, in the name of God. Uh, and that's not connection back to that, that Jesus. It's, you know, like we have, we have been given a distortion in a lot of ways. And so we're trying to get back to the root of things and ask who is Jesus actually, and trying to form that in the context we have today, which is terribly difficult. But it's the work we have to do. It's the work before us. I'm not sure how to ease um, those fears for people because I am certainly one of the people they're probably worried about. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, but I would encourage them to read my books and enter into the stories of people who are trying to live this today. I mean, I don't, that's what I would say. I don't know if it's helpful, but that's what I'd say. <laughs> it's helpful, yeah. I think people, more and more people should read your books. So. Um made of and living resistance and your winter's what was it called winter's gift yeah winter's gifts yeah i think yeah all of those um people should be reading and more just native american books in right. general we don't read enough of them and and then we all have all these assumptions of what they believe what they are, who they are without reading any any authors who are Native Americans. So I feel, you know, we as Americans living here and around the world need to learn more about Native Americans, Aboriginals, uh, you know, in Canada, First Nations, etc. because there is so much wisdom that you guys are sharing with us. If only we can, we will listen. And you mentioned Mother Earth so many times, you know, that, you know, that's so important for so many of us to listen to, but we don't. And we just live our own lives and forget about Mother Earth and creation and, and creation care. So I'm so grateful for your voice and always kind of raising this up and, and putting it in your in your books. So thank you so much. Um, your book also mentioned about the raised fist. And I think many of us are familiar with the raised fist. So I don't know if you want to share a little bit about art and resistance with us. Yeah, I was really excited to write a chapter on 
art as resistance because it is, it's such a beautiful, you know, the creators of our day are such beautiful artists, such power. Art has had so much power always. Um, and I was thinking about as I was writing that, that section, well, from the moment I knew I was going to write a book on resistance, I had to come to my own thoughts on whether I would put a raised fist on the front. And I knew right away, I didn't want to just because, um, I wanted people to see the cover and be even maybe a little confused by it. I want people to see the cover and think, oh, well, that's a book on resistance. Why does it look like that? Like, why does it have all these colors and why does it look so flowy and what I don't understand, you know, because a lot of things you see the word resistance and it's the raised fist right away, which is beautiful and powerful. Um, and I write about it in the book, but I thought about, you know, um, when, when we were at the peak of COVID, um, going through all of this, how artists just like came out of all these hiding places online on the virtual world and showed up on Instagram all the time. You could hear concerts from your favorite people or hear book readings from all these authors. It was, it was so painful, but it was so beautiful. Um, to see artists just like showing up, selling their art, doing these art art pop-ups, even virtually. It was so beautiful and showed that um, that art is resistance. And it certainly has been for me my whole life. I mean, I, I've been a poet since I was young. So words have literally been my safety, my hiding place, you know, like where I've been held, but also the way I've tried to process the world. And uh, through, you know, I played guitar when I was young. So playing guitar and writing music, writing songs to now writing books. And that's been my form, my creative expression of resistance. And so I, um, I give so much, uh, credit and, and respect to the raised fist. And yet it also is important to name how, and I write about this too, how we can take a symbol and, distort it to become anything we want it to be really you know you have people on very wide spectrums who could use the raised fist to mean very different things and that's scary um but that also shows how powerful just like how powerful stories are it can be scary how powerful art can be you know it should it should um we should hold a lot of respect and sort of reverence for how powerful art can be as we create it for the form of resistance we want it to be. And, you know, and, um, and I really wanted to, to name that. And both of my books, well, and my, my new, my children's book as well, they're all, you know, indigenous artists and illustrators, and it's just been such a gift to work with them. And just, I mean, the, the care and the care they put into these images, you know, you can just feel it, it's so palpable. And so I was so excited to write a book on resistance and have it be this kind of image, you know, just to pull us in to think of it differently. Again, I just want us to think of things in, in new ways or, you know, find different avenues of art. And so I hope that it encourages people to do that. Well, can you open up the book again? Because this is one of the first books where I've seen like art yeah, I was on so the cover excited. when you open it. I know. And it's I was so excited when they, when they did this. It's the publisher um told you they did, oh, or did you ask no they did this and the little mushrooms we we didn't have room to put them on the front and I was like I love the mushrooms <laughs> so they put them on the front <laughs> and I was so grateful when I saw the oh. little mushrooms but yeah, yeah it's great I've never seen a book where they have some artwork right when you open it so yeah. it's beautiful and thank you for sharing that you are a music well, you wrote songs. I don't know if you want to share any songs with us today. Oh, or no. next time you come it's on. It's been so long. I play oh. piano now just as a form yeah. of just, and I write about that too, but as a form I know you wrote about it. I was like, wow, that's so interesting. You know, I just play chords and sing. It's nothing, nothing I'll ever probably share publicly, <laughs> but, um, but I, I do love, I love singing and I miss it. You know, I miss uh, having some of those moments. So I, yeah, I appreciate art so much. And I, we have so many more beautiful kind of landscapes to explore as artists. And I can't wait to see where that goes in the coming years, you know, as far as how we explore the world and our faith and our spirituality. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I just wanted to reflect a little bit about the art that, you know, I, I did go to Israel and Palestine and the, the, the Bethlehem wall or the wall 
of separation between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. On the Bethlehem side, there are so many artists who draw pictures of hope and resistance, and it's so powerful. I took videos and pictures of it. And, you know, the human nature to resist, you know, occupation, colonialism, or any form of evil, people do share in the form of art. So I'm so glad that um, you included that here and the various ways that the fists has been used or misused. So I'm so grateful for that. I just find your book so deep. You know, you 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 included poetry. And I remember the last time you were on, I said, I, I want to write poetry. And then you just said, you know, just write. You know, since the last time I spoke to you, I wrote one poem. Yeah. But anyway, it's not that's that great, but I was though. That's awesome. I know. So I feel like that's one more than any that yeah. I've done in my life, kind of. So you motivate me so oh, much. Thank <laughs> you so much. Yeah, so thank you for all your motivation because your books are so inspiring. So here in this book, you mentioned it earlier when we were kind of talking about your book right at the beginning of the podcast and you talk about the four realms. Right. I just found that so powerful. So for those who haven't read your book, kind of tell us how you came up with these four realms and how it works within your book. Yeah. And so what they I, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so if anyone has seen um the medicine wheel, which is a a tool that a lot of us are teaching, a lot of us use as indigenous people, but um as Anishinaabe people, we have we follow the medicine wheel. It's a it's a good guide for life. You know, it's it's a circle, it's split into four quadrants and it's got four different colors. And you know, these different colors represent seasons of life they represent the literal seasons they represent the four directions there's so much so much inside of it and and teaching and that really inspired me i knew i knew that i wanted something again that was cyclical and seasonal but i didn't want it to obviously just be the medicine wheel i wanted to figure out a different way to explore it and so i thought well a uh, um oh my gosh what is it called what are these called? Oh my goodness. Um, Four Ralphs? Oh, Venn the first diagram. one. Per- a Venn oh, Venn diagram. Diagram. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> so the, the Venn diagram where, you know, I wanted it, I wanted the realms to overlap. They needed, they, I didn't want them to just be completely separate from one another. So this Venn diagram design, and I literally like, I had the design in my head for a long time, but I didn't have any colors with it yet. I didn't have the seasons attached yet. So it was very vague but I knew that was the going to be the framework for my book um and that's often how I write I'll have like I know the sections and I know Mm -hmm. some of the stories I want in each section and then I kind of you know puzzle it together and then the the details come in as I'm writing so I remember our kids were virtual for a while for school and I remember the first week they went back to school I you know I got um got out four like pieces of paper. I taped them together. Now I'm not artistic in the drawing sense. I can write books for years, but don't ask me to like draw you a dog. Okay. (laughs) So, um, so I like taped some paper together. I took a dinner plate and I drew, I drew my Venn diagram on this giant piece of paper. And then I took colored pencils and I colored in the colors and I thought, okay, this is it, you know, and I finally, oh, and there's seasons to go with these. And, oh, you know, what if, there's sort of a Potawatomi word that could go with them. Like it just all finally came together. And I was so excited. I took a picture and sent it to my editor at, at Brazos. And, you know, I was just so excited. Like it finally, like I, the framework has finally come together and it's cohesive. And so these four realms are not meant to be like you finish one and move to the next. It can be a bit, but like I said earlier, we're always looping back and visiting other spaces inside of ourselves. So the top realm, this red one is our season of winter. And it's, um, it's red to represent like our heart in Potawatomi, we say our day. It's our, it's like the, the center of our heart where we're really learning to love ourselves. It's the personal spaces, right? That's the, like the everyday self-love that a lot of us don't practice for ourselves. And that is resistance. I mean, that care for ourselves is real and it and it bleeds into all of our work in the world. And then you have um the the brown color is 
the communal realm. So you move from the personal to the communal, which is like, you know, solidarity and kinship and caring for the earth. This is all, I talk about this time as springtime when we're sort of planting our seeds in the ground to see what will grow. And then the third realm is the ancestral realm and it's blue and it represents summertime and water and our ancestors. And we all have ancestors. So how do we deal with that? How do we reckon with who we are in our place in history? And this also is this space. I knew this realm would be difficult for some people, including myself, to write about or not just difficult, but not totally clear. And I wanted, and I had, a, it needs to be that way, sort of, it needs to be fluid and moving and, and this place we may not fully understand. And I think what's beautiful about that is remembering that the time, our life right now, the time we live in is we live in the middle of those who came before us and those who come after us. And we're, we're living our life now. So what can we help heal from our own ancestors? And what can we give to our our future descendants, whoever they are. And then the center, I called the integral realm. So think of the word integration and it's our, it's autumn, which is my favorite season. And it's our skode or our fire. So it's like once, once we've visited the other realms, once we've done some of this work, what are we now pulling into the core of who we are? And this is where I, I write about things like prayer and dreaming and especially lifelong resistance. Uh, I, I touch on this all the time, but I, we live in a world where it's kind of like, read the book, check it off your list, and then you've done the work. And so people will read a book, post it on Instagram, say they read the book or they did the book club. And then they think that they've like, then they think that things are fixed and then they get really frustrated when they're not fixed. And, and I think we have done ourselves a disservice in treating resistance or activism or healing like that. And so I, I end the book with this chapter on lifelong resistance, that this, this work is going to take our entire lives and the day we die, we still won't have done it all, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know, like we still have to go on the journey. And I really wanted that to be clear that, that I ended the book that way in hopes that people will take that and, you know, figure out whatever realm they're in and ask themselves what realm is speaking to them and, and go on that journey. So I hope the book isn't even always read in a linear way, but that people kind of hop around and, you know, read different chapters or visit different sections. So. Wow. That's so helpful. So thank you. It feels like when I write, I just kind of just go without any plan, but you, you are so intentional with all your writing. So thank you so much. You're teaching me so many things. I need to be a bit more intentional, I think. So thank you for sharing about the four realms and your book is divided in that way. So it's just beautiful. And I, you know, I think some books you just need to read once and then you're done with it. But this one, I, I need to come back again. And I think I'll take your suggestion of not reading it. Yeah. Just yeah, not linear, but go back and forth. I'll take that because some of them really spoke a lot to me and then I have to go back and read those. So thank you so much. Um, you also talk about presence in your book um, and it's about recognizing our relationship to ourselves and one another. That was really, um, it stuck with me because I always thought, oh, I yeah, I need to be present for my kids or my family, but I never thought of it uh, in our relationship to ourselves, it was like, it really hit me. So I don't know if you want to expand on that and tell us what it really means to um, recognizing our relationship to ourselves. Yeah, you know, I am um, just growing up in, in some trauma, I became, you know, disembodied for a lot of my life. And so I'm working toward embodiment and presence with myself so much, you know, I had I've had health issues. I've had things that have been going on in my body. My body's been telling me things for so many years and I never knew how to listen. I mean, I just, I had no idea, you know? And so I'm just now in my thirties starting to learn how to listen and like that, oh, my body's sending me a message, sending me a text right now. I should read the text or it's like, it's saying something. And, um, I think a few years back I wrote, I don't even remember where it was, maybe in a a talk I wrote, but I, I wrote about, um, 
like holding a moment of silence for ourselves. Like what if we, you know how we do that for world tragedies or a death of someone? What if we like stopped and held a moment, took a moment of silence where all we did was just hold ourselves and care for two minutes or something, you know, that kind that's, that's the, the idea behind it is practicing presence with ourselves. And I know a lot of us have been told that that's selfish and it is not selfish because we cannot do the beautiful work we want to do in the world if we don't care about ourselves. And a lot of us, a lot of human beings struggle with self-love, like really loving ourselves well. And we have a lot of shame and fear and guilt that we just carry around all the time. And it is so um, harmful to every part of us, to our souls, to our minds, to our bodies. And so there's so much care that we can do in just practicing presence and paying attention. Um, I, I write about my struggles with anxiety and what that means for me in my work life and in my personal life with my family. I write an essay about it. And, um, and that's, that's something I've just started being more vocal about because I'm hoping it helps others who struggle with some of these things that we, we will always struggle. There will be harder days. There will be amazing days, but we can still do um, really good work and rest when we need to rest and practice care. And all of that is resistance. And I don't think we always think of it that way, but it really is. Wow. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's so helpful for me. And I'm sure it'd be helpful for many of the Madame podcast listeners. Um, in your book, you touch about that you are a very ritualistic person. And I found that very interesting because, you know, growing up, uh, especially from a mother, things like that was like, oh, it, it's kind of almost like borderline evil. My mother was very conservative. And so I've always moved away from that. And when I go to places and they hold rituals, I always get really afraid because of what my mother used to do. So share with us what resistance, I mean, what um, a ritualistic means to you and what it means to be a ritualistic person. Yeah, that's so interesting because I grew up, I remember, um, you know, growing up Southern Baptist when I'd hear the word meditation, because what was it? Um, well, you could only meditate, but if it was meditating on scripture, but if there's any other kind of meditation, it was evil. And I remember yeah. thinking that as a kid, you know, being terrified of this idea, this word meditation that, you know, and so that's I would think that's, yeah, I was so like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. And now, you know, there's so much research done on how much meditation helps us as people, especially people with anxiety, how much it helps us to calm our minds and our bodies. And anyway, but those are just some of the things we grow up with within Christianity that um, there's this fear embedded in us. And I, you know, as a kid, I, I would do little ritualistic things. Like when I would load the dishwasher, I would like pray as I load the dishwasher and I would like set things in, in certain way, you know, I just, I just did it. It was just a part of me and it's this, this little, little quirky things, you know, or, um, and now I'm realizing, you know, like I need the same, um, morning ritual every day. Uh, so when I travel, it really throws me off if I don't have that, or when I, um, am at home and I'm not able to sort of have that time to settle into my day and have ritual of, journaling and reading while I have my coffee or, you know, whatever it is. Um, some people might call that ritual. Others just might, I don't, I don't know what other kind of words people have for it, but just setting intention, setting intentional time for something that brings us care or something that feeds our souls or our hearts or our bodies, you know, even sitting down to a healthy lunch and really being present, that can be a ritual, you know, um, but you're right. A lot of us who grew up within some Christian spaces were, you know, we had these negative connotations with things that are actually really such a beautiful part of our, our care and our spiritual life now. And, um, and, you know, ritual can also be so communal. It's, you know, I mean, I know now learning more, you know, about uh, ceremony and, and indigenous lens and, and what that means, even a powwow and the ways that we celebrate our relationship to creator and to mother earth and each other through ritual and ceremony. I mean, that's such a beautiful um, and powerful thing. And honestly, I wish I, I wish I had uh, more of it in my life. I'm still trying to incorporate more ritual in my own life and 
Um, that's something I think I'll always be working toward as well. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been a lot of fear, right? Insinuated. Oh yeah, so much fear and yeah, about rituals. So thank you so much for elaborating on that. It's really helpful for me and I'm sure it's helpful for many people who have grown up like us. Right, so right. Thank you. Yeah, there were so many good parts about your book, but one of the ones I really liked was about uh, your chapter on nap ministry. <laughs> Just I looked at that. I thought I read it wrong, nap ministry. And I thought, because you're talking about uh, to resist systems, telling us to do more. And as a Korean, you know, and, you know, the East Asian cultures is all about doing, doing your, you know, in Korea, it's a six day, it's a six day work day. Um, school was six days. I don't know if they cut it back to five now, but it's like this constant um, cultural teaching of work, work, work. You got to do more and more. That's why there's so much um, uh, uh, suicide rates because they can't accomplish what their peers are accomplishing or co-workers and that you find that in China and Japan. So I just love that part because it's really, you kind of, I felt like you wrote it for me. <laughs> so tell us about that part. Yeah. Cause I yeah. felt like you were just writing to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyone listening to this should absolutely read um, Trisha Hersey's book, uh, Rest is Resistance. So she's the, the woman who started the nap ministry. She's a black woman and she writes about the power of naps, the power of rest, of resisting that status quo. And in America, of course we have it. It's, you know, we're, we're taught from, I think, I mean, a young age, but especially from sort of middle school on, you know, this is how you balance a checkbook and this is how you start to get things done and kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like this is how you become a working member of society. And if you don't fit any of this, if you're, if you're disabled and you can't do the things, then you're, you're worthless. Or if you, um, don't do the things in this way, if you don't fit, if you're not a real man and you can do the work like this, then you're not a real man at all. You know, like we have so many, um, messages that we send to one another, whether we realize it or not for women, like the ways that we, as women are supposed to get so much done and be paid very little for what we do. Um, there's just, uh, so much. And we are, we're told to sort of tick the boxes in the right way all the time. We always have a running list of boxes to be ticked, don't we? And um, how can we resist that and still do our work well? And there has to be some sort of balance. And I'm uh, certainly still failing at that and learning it and trying to find ways to um, get around that, even that self-talk of you haven't done enough today. You haven't, mm -hmm you know, hit this goal today. You haven't hit this goal this week. So your whole week must have been lost because you didn't do that. And, and that is such a, um, it ends up being so dehumanizing for us. Right. And it, and again, it, um, it takes us away from these important conversations of seasonal ways of living. Uh, people who menstruate literally have four seasons in one month. We live a cycle every single month. And I never, I didn't learn that growing up, which is such a disservice. All I learned was you're going to get a period. It's going to be gross. Here's what you do. Then it'll be over and you might get some cramps. And that was it. And there was no, you know, intense conversations on what hormones are or how can you honor your body throughout the month? Or, you know, that's just, that's a big example in my life personally is, oh my gosh, I have to fight the the go, go, go mentality because my body is living in different phases every single month. So can I honor those different phases of my, of my month? Can I honor that and still get my work done and be a productive member of society? And, um, and the fact that we're so, it's so difficult for us to manage that just shows a lot, you know, and I, I want to write more on that in the future. Uh -huh. And I well, I hope you do. And I think I might have to do it for myself to just as a big reminder, because, you know, as I said, this East Asian culture, and I, I raised my kids like that, too. And when my oldest was in grade four or five, he had this um, Hopkins summer camp. And in the morning, he told me to go um, buy him some white t shirts. Um, so it was like eight in the morning, and then I had to pick him up at 9pm. It was an all day event uh, for the summer. And when I picked him up at night, 
he, he asked me, he said, did you get them? And I said, no. And then he turned to me and he said, well, what did you do all day? <laughs> so, you know, you got to keep yourself busy. Yes. He yeah. thought, you know, I wasn't busy enough. So I should have got. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just, yeah. I love your, uh, that chapter. It was like, yeah, I need to, it was like written for me. So thank you for kind of sharing it um, with me on this podcast. Oh. I appreciate it so much. So, uh, you know, you write as an Indigenous woman, overcoming the misogyny and colonization of the purity movement mm. is resistance in every way. So uh, can you share us, share with us a bit about that? Yeah, I think I write about this a lot in Native as well. I write about going through the purity movement, but, um, you know, uh, this again, ironically, is connected to a menstruating young girl's body that we were we were told messages about what it means to be pure and i i think it's in this book i write about the the meaning of the name caitlin is pure purity and i always thought oh well i'm i'm the perfect poster child for the purity movement aren't i you know like this is great i fit right in and and so um you know but at that time i didn't realize the damage and the trauma that was being done to so many all sorts of bodies, all sorts of young people, um, this ethic that we were being taught about our bodies and, but especially young girls bodies and the way that we were, uh, we were being taught that we were just these, we really were, even though I think they meant the opposite, we were being taught that we were just this sexual object. So don't wear too short of shorts. Don't wear too small of tank tops because you'll, you'll be the one causing your brothers to lust so it's all on you that, that those kinds of messages and um really having no power over our own bodies and and hearts really it was it was kind of like i hold my body and heart for now with god but eventually it'll just belong to my future husband that was kind of the sentiment and uh you know and that's that's taken years and will continue to take years for me to sort of undo and to find the beauty and power of my own heart, my own body as I am as a woman. Um, that's, that's been, um, really painful and that doesn't even name how it's affected others, you know, uh, queer kids or non-binary kids or young men as well. I mean, it's affected so many of us in so many different ways, but, um, it is a, it's a colonial and, uh, patriarchal system that, that I grew up in. And that was really, it took me, you know, it's taken me a lot of years to recognize that for what it is, um, and the damage that it's caused me. I mean, it caused me just so much damage to my own self-esteem and self-worth. And that, and I, I know I'm not alone in it. There are a lot of, a lot of people trying to work through that now. And we have open conversations about it on Instagram and in our books and all sorts of places. So um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for those conversations, sort of critiquing and naming some of these things. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Your book has so much wisdom. It's not a thick, long book. It's a readable book. Um, you know, we can spend a whole day talking about it. But to wrap up, I did want to talk about you, you wrote that one step toward decolonization is to begin resisting the idea that the land is a commodity or product. And I just really love that. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work with the World Council of Churches on Climate Change and the Lutheran World Federation. One of um, their model for a long time was creation, not for sale. So I thought when you're talking about land is um, the idea that, you know, we've got to resist it, that land is a commodity. It's just so, it just spoke to me and it's so powerful. And I'm sure all the readers will be, uh, you know, motivated to do, you know, to, to live differently. So I don't know if you wanted to say a bit more uh, before we wrap up. Yeah, this is this is something I've um, just been really passionate about, especially in the last few years, trying to name the importance of, even in our, our climate movements, it's a lot of uh, heady science and a lot of to-do lists without any sort of conversations about our relationship with Mother Earth. Like, what's grounded in our bodies and in our minds when we think of who mother earth is as this being that holds us and cares for us. And I think that in, 
especially in this book, I talk about it so much. Um, but really helping people, if we want to try to break away and sort of start unlearning that commodity mindset, part of that work has to be that we reinvest ourselves into trying to care for our personal and collective relationship to Mother Earth. And that could mean, I tell people to start a love letters to Mother Earth journal, like start your own personal journal where you're just, you're trying to work through this relationship and where it has been harmed and how it can be repaired. That is a huge part of, that can be a huge part of our spiritual life, whether we realize it or not. And it could be so beautiful to do that on the personal level. And then what could that change on our collective level? When we're starting to get more grounded in that relationship, we're starting to understand why the land is not just this commodity, this thing, but this being that we are in relationship with. And how could that change the work we do on the collective level? Um, I'm really passionate about that. And I know I'm not the only one speaking to it. And I'm really grateful for that. And I think that that's something I leave people with a lot when I travel and speak and in my books is just, just holding that that space of people to please investigate your relationship to mother earth, you know, ask questions. And cause I grew up, you know, in the Southern Baptist world, there was no talk of kinship or care. It was not, it was the dominion conversation. That was it. You know, there was no, and then we all go to heaven or hell. So there's nothing to really worry about once we're all gone anyway. Right. And that was it. That was it. And so, um, to think about our space and time differently, and this relationship, I think, is really, really important for the time we're living in. Yeah. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you so much for spending time with me on Madame Podcast, for returning uh, to Madame Podcast. And thank you so much for writing this book, Living Resistance. It's such a helpful book. It's so life-giving. So many bits of wisdom here and there sprinkled all over the place. And it was, you know, some parts made me laugh and some parts, you know, want to make me want to cry. So thank you so much for writing this book. And I can't wait to see what you write next. I don't know if you're working on another book. Oh, besides the children's one that you're doing, is there another book that you're working on? Not right now. Right now I'm writing a lot at the Liminality Journal, my sub stack. So that's oh, a great okay. place. Poetry and essays. So if anyone wants to write poetry with me, I will be, I do that there every now and then. So um, okay. yeah, I'm I'm at the Liminality Journal a lot, but um, trying to, to get these these children books out over the next few years so yeah, yeah that's wonderful so congratulations on the children's book and living resistance i hope all the listeners will go out and get a copy of this and the children's book and your other book native they're all so important so thank you so much for spending um time with me i know you're very busy i'm so grateful for you and for your work thank so you. thank you so much for coming on my damn podcast so good to see you yeah Thank you. Join Trip Fuller and Dan Koch for a new homebrewed Christianity class on Live Before You Die, Existentialism in Psychology and Theology, starting October 3rd, 2023. This is a transformative course which delves deep into the nexus of existential thought as viewed through the dual lenses of psychology and theology. Participants will embark on an introspective journey to confront and understand the fundamental truths of human existence. This class is pay what you can, including free. Sign up at www.tripfuller.com. One of our wonderful sponsors of today's podcast is Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, a progressive, spiritually centered servant seminary that seeks to form courageous leaders in the way of Jesus to cultivate communities of justice, compassion, and hope. Garrett offers degree programs in different areas of church and nonprofit leadership, including a Master of Divinity, Master's Degree in Counseling, Education, Public Ministry, and Theology, Doctor of Ministry, and a Doctor of Philosophy. If you want to take the next step in your education, you can study in person or online at Garrett. Apply before November 15, and you could be eligible for a minimum 65% scholarship up to 100% off tuition. Visit G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot E-D-U forward slash M-A-D-A-N-G. That's G-A-R-R-E-T-T 
dot edu forward slash madang. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com.